Welcome back to the Marvel Movie Minute, a daily podcast in which we explore the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe one minute at a time. In this, our fifth season, we are looking at Joe Johnston's 2011 film, Captain America, The First Avenger. I'm Andy Nelson from True Story FM. And I'm Pete Wright from True Story FM 2. Today, we are talking about Minute 5, which begins with a rumble in the walls and ends with a silhouette in the broken wall. Oh, very intense, Andy. Well, a very rumbly start of this minute. We actually come in on the end of the Tower Keeper's line. He uh, finishes up what he was saying from yesterday's minute. Uh, He had started or he had ended last minute saying, let them come. And he finishes here saying, they'll never find it. And, uh, you know... (laughs) Things fall apart after that, literally. Spoiler. <laughs> yeah. The two of them look around like, this rumbling isn't something I've dealt with before. What the heck is going on? This is like earthquake territory rumbling as as uh, they're staring at the walls. We cut to a fantastic rack of ancient helmets on a, on a, la- uh, like a, uh, a rack with a bunch of candles and they're all rattling and uh, then everything stops. This is I, I I really like this particular reveal because it's you can feel what's going on outside that this tank that we talked about in yesterday's minute pulls up to the front door and then they take a beat and then somebody in the tank pushes a button that launches this ram that just pushes in on the door. That's kind of what it feels like to me. It's just like, OK, just a little tap. It's it's a complete uh yeah in in the context of of battering rams it does a fantastic job of taking out the entire door it's like it's like a giant knocking right that's basically what happens here because it hits the door frame like the door doesn't come down the entire frame does crushes yawn in the process uh you know we'll find out poor yawn ends up dead as a as he gets buried in rubble um but we do see a shot of this ram this battering ram which is called, Pete, do you have any guess as to what the battering ram at the head of this tank is called? Um, Der Blundstone. <laughs> I like where you're going with that. It is actually called yeah. the Fist of God. Oh, yeah. No, I was close. <laughs> you, were, you were so close. You were just so stinking close. I'm going to see. Hold yeah. on. Fist of God. I'm going to translate this to to German. Let's see. What is it in oh, good. Uh, German? They would call it Faust Gottes. Faust Gottes, yeah. No, Faust I Gottes. checked out. That, yeah. that would have been my second guess. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, this thing, I, the, well, the one thing I was curious about this is like, is this, like, do they have to, is the reason they stopped because the 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 tank engineers, they have to hop out and they have to put this on the head of the tank? Like, where is, or does this like <laughs> protrude from it? Like, we never see it in action. I'm curious, they like, have where. They come out and screw it in. That's what they do. They're screwing <laughs> right. it in in that beat. It's very odd. Yeah, you're right. We never see it because it's kind of a transformery thing. Like, and we and because we don't have any context for the size and shape of the tank yeah. beyond the treads. And I shall say, like our uh, high the, the the truck in the first minute, two sets or a set of double headlights on this tank too. Every but everything has two headlights. But we never see what it looks like, so they get away with a lot. Like they, this could really just be. A, a transformer for all we know it's it seems that way it's a it's a funky thing yeah because we do cut to the exterior of the church all we see are the treads as it's backing up with those headlights mm-hmm. as you said I, I will say just to quickly call out last minute the deleted scene and likely um, i'm not completely sure but likely when we see this particular exterior shot uh, they did film these uh, street scenes for tonesburg norway in the scottish village of cool ross Okay. So there was some actual exterior location filmed there. Um, I I just can't tell. Definitely like when we had our two guys running through the streets and stuff, that was in Cool Ross in Scotland. I'm not 100% sure if this shot was uh, digitally created or uh, like on a stage or what. But I know a lot of the stuff with this particular car that we're about to talk about was filmed on the stage. So it's possible. It does feel a, a bit stagey. It does, yeah, it definitely does. Um, the car, of course, that we're talking about is a fantastic, fantastic coupe. Is it the is is it like the Hydra coupe? Because everything's the Hydra. It's something. It's just Schmidt's coupe. Schmidt's, Schmitt's coupe. coupe. Yeah. Well, I love Schmidt's coupe, and and I uh, was stymied by the headlights. Uh, it has six 
lights uh, on the car. Two of them are on either side of the car on the fenders, and then four more lights pointing right at us as the as the coupe comes into view are slits. They are slit headlights. And uh, were you familiar before you saw this movie with slit headlights? No, but what when I saw this, I'm like, that is the coolest thing to do to your headlights. And I instantly yeah. wanted to like buy some slit caps for my own headlights and create this on my car. I don't think it quite works on as the, well in like a, a modern minivan. But no, you know. I was just going to say on the minivan you're talking about right now. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I uh, I thought this was really fascinating. Um, th- these the slit treatment. It's actually a it's a mechanical treatment. There are there are some that that you where you can open the aperture and close it again. Uh, but in this case, it is it's set such that um, it, it's an anti bombing tool. It's it's harder to see this car with its headlights on from the air because it, it is such a, a focused beam coming off of the car. So it is a tool to avoid aerial attack mm. uh, using these slits over the headlights. And I thought that was a very cool and deeply menacing approach to Schmidt's coupe. Oh. As we yeah. as, as we push in, the car pushes in and we push in on the uh, on the actual um, ornament, the hood ornament, which is the Hydra logo. The Hydra logo. Yeah, it is a fantastic fantastically creepy logo it's a great push in i mean we come off of the treads of the tank all in this is a great just a single shot and then the coupe is pulling toward us with those fantastic menacing headlights i love how they the there's enough smoke from all the rubble and everything that you have fantastic light streams pointing down from each of those headlights it just it's a beautiful beautiful shot as it goes right into that uh that hydra logo as you said which is a gorgeous gorgeous logo interestingly something that took quite a lot of work to design um because i i can't remember what it was i think that they were they were balancing like trying not to make it look too comic booky but keeping it looking comic booky in the end they added the te- the um suction cups to the tentacles and they felt like that gave it kind of a look like gears, which felt very much something that fit with um, with what they were doing with Hydra and the technology that Hydra was using. I, I have a question about Hydra. Mm, okay. So at the end of these, these this is one head. It's like a skull head with six tentacles, right? Correct. But a Hydra is one body with many heads right correct it, and and i've seen it in like in uh kind of uh, uh in different forms the the original greek like i've seen it as kind of a serpent presented as a serpent like a water creature i've seen it with four legs like and a tail but lots of heads i'm just curious how they got hydra from this logo or how they got this logo from hydra when what they've just designed is a six-legged skull octopus. <laughs> Six, right, exactly. So it'd be a, a sextopus. Yeah, it's a sextopus. <laughs> right, or a hexapus, I guess you could call <laughs> which, it. Which is actually the, uh, <laughs> the title of one of the sequels of Captain America 79, the sextopus. <laughs> the sextopus. <laughs> they were, they, I think it was in the 80s, they were trying to compete with octopussy. Yes, right. <laughs> Captain America Jeez. and the sextopus. Do you have you ever stopped to think about that? Uh, you know, I, I haven't until you were talking about it, but I know it is something that has uh, changed over time. I think that at one point it was ahead of a ram. I'm not necessarily talking about like th- for the movie, but I think over time there were different designs for it. Yeah, the initial symbol was one for a sacrificial lamb. And, um, uh, I, I don't know. It's interesting that that's kind of where they came with it. And, and part of it is the pagan myths uh, involving the devil. And that's why the initial Hydra logo was a symbol for a ram's head associated with the devil. So um, and then I think they took that ram's head and they kind of kept it looking like um they wanted that kind of the death head in there, which is why they kept the skull as far as the um, the the Hydra creature. Um, I'm not exactly sure other than the fact that when you're talking about Hydra heads, they are on long necks and that's something that's typically been depicted. And so I guess that makes it kind of uh, tentacular, which doesn't make a ton of sense, but 
um, I guess there's an element of it. Well, it doesn't, especially because in the logo, I would want to see six little skull heads on the end of each tentacle. Yeah, right. That's what I would want. There, uh, it does seem that there was an element of um, the Inhumans that was brought into this. They they used some uh, from from Hive, who was an Inhuman banished from Earth because of his parasitic powers. Uh, his worshippers formed a society that aimed to bring him back. The society eventually evolved into Hydra. So. Maybe that's part of it, too. Um, yeah, maybe. Yeah, because definitely uh, the look there is a head with a lot of tentacles coming off of the head sort of thing. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm okay letting it go, but just know it's out there. What I love about it is it, it has become such an iconic logo that I love the look of it. But yeah, when you actually think about the concept, it becomes like uh, like an octopus person. <laughs> it's really kind of what it looks like. Right. And and not just the concept, but literally dialogue, you know, cut off one head and two come in its place. They say those words and nowhere in their in their imagery. So this is a marketing problem because nowhere in their imagery do they actually showcase any of that possibility. Like it should be an actual Hydra. That's where I that's where I stand. No, I get it. I get it. So we go from there. We see uh, feet get out of the uh, Schmidt's coop. Not just feet, but jackboots. Like this is jackboots, uh, which yeah. I, I love. You know, we had a reference to jackboots in you know your jackbooted thugs, as uh, as we had Eric talking to to Shield about like the Shield jackbooted thugs and all that in Thor. Yeah. And now we actually have jackboots popping up in this particular film, which is fantastic. Very menacing. Very menacing feet. We presume those menacing jackbooted feet belong to Schmidt because they got out of Schmidt's car. Yeah, although it doesn't say Schmidt's Coop like written on the side or anything, so it's right, not like right, it's not right. like we saw the license plate <laughs> like cartoon Her, Herr Schmidt. Yeah, this is Schmidt. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah, we feel like this is a leader. This is an authority figure. I mean, we have this cool, this amazing tank, but then we also have this ridiculously cool car. Uh, just talking about Schmidt's Coop real quick. Um, uh, Daniel Simon, uh, one of the designers on the film, uh, he said, in the story, Schmidt's Coop is supposed to be the fastest car of its time, not due to its aerodynamics, but its incredible power. A conventional 16-cylinder super, supercharged aircraft engine. As a car designer by, by heart, I was excited and terrified by the task. Uh, Joe, Rick, and I spent quite some time researching coupes of the 40s and defining the style of it. In the beginning, I envisioned Smith's car shaped like a 1937 Auto Union Type C streamliner, but I soon understand Joe is looking for something classic and upright. And so they ended up kind of going with this this coupe, which is huge. They used a truck chassis and truck wheels to to make it, and then they had to find all these great curves for it and this essentially kind of a big cockpit seating area for it. They said you couldn't scale a classic car to this size. It would have looked ridiculous. So they had to really balance all the proportions and everything to make it work exactly the way they wanted it to. And in the end, it ended up being, I think, one of the uh, one of the coolest vehicles in the MCU. And I will say, it's such a cool kind of classic looking car. It would be, I mean, this would be me be retro uh, writing all this, but it's such a cool car. I'd love to see that somehow Tony Stark had ended up finding this and buying this and having it in his collection of cars. Wouldn't that be a great little throwback? Absolutely. Yeah, like some, and and then made it fly. You know, like it was one of the <laughs> one of the ones he does a conversion on. Uh, um, but yeah, yeah, I love the car. Yeah, but it's a cool car, and uh, and he gets out. He's next to this tank. This is the Uber tank we didn't mention. Um, it is a massive, massive tank. We'll talk more about this as it goes. But it is just just enormous, and I mean, you could fit like a village inside this thing. So everything Schmidt does is big. Yeah. But yeah, then we cut inside and we have uh, now now we've hit this point where, OK, we know these Norwegians speak um, uh, Norwegian. All of the the Germans at this point, though, that are going to be speaking are going to be speaking English. We're not going to be um, we're not doing any sort of trick where they start speaking German and we zoom in on a mouth and pull back and suddenly they're speaking English. No, we're ah, just the old hunt for Red October uh, Gambit. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I, I will say I recently rewatched Judgment at Nuremberg. They do the same thing there, so you can't. They do the same. You can't thing. call it yeah. out as as something that um, uh, McTiernan came up with. No, 
pretty pretty yeah it's interesting excited by that but anyway we don't get that we we get the german officer here who is telling them to open this tomb they're trying to get the the tomb opened up here yes and this is where the the gambit is we you know that they say open the tomb they have a bunch of guys trying to do it uh they clearly are uh, not able to move the lid and then we get the the turn right the camera moves around behind the uh behind the actual tomb to reveal standing in the hollowed out door or the hollowed out what once was the door frame is this person standing in a an appropriately authoritarian pose and backlit by the tank's headlights, which are clearly articulating because now they're pointing both straight down and in on Schmidt in his Hydra hero entrance. Uh, I mean, they're pretty high up. I mean, the tank is, I mean, it's massive. Well, I just think those those lights, like there's no way those, two, why would you design those lights to always point down and in? Well, down, I understand. I don't have a problem with them pointing down. And in, I I guess that when I was picturing it, and maybe, you know, um, uh, maybe it doesn't make a ton of sense, but I was picturing that it's just such a wide swath of light that we're only seeing it pointing in because we're in the frame of that hole in the wall. But it does make me think as I look at it, like, I wonder if those things are also pointing like all the way around the other side, like almost uh, not quite a 180, but like 140 degrees. So you have this huge area where they're illuminated. I would agree with that had they not already established that there are only two lens like light lenses in the in each set of lights like there isn't a like we already established a few seconds ago that it's just the two headlights on each side. Right but but each set of headlights could be spreading across like a you know 140 degree radius don't you think? Yeah yeah it could it could I guess I would just want I would want them to be able to turn. That's why I, okay. well, that's yeah. why I'm pushing it. Because it go. seems cool to be able to turn their headlights. Yeah. Well, it certainly works in in Schmidt's case because he's like, I want the yeah. lights to point to me. I need the spotlights <laughs> on the me. You know, you know, this yeah. season is going to be full of a lot of terrible German accents. Oh, yeah. All over yeah. the place. <laughs> Actually, I could I could say listeners are lucky that it's taken all the way to minute five to get the first one. Well, we haven't had any Germans speaking until minute five, so it makes sense. Oh, <laughs> uh, it's okay. so much fun. So much fun. So this was interesting. In this establishing shot of Schmidt, they have – earlier we see uh, that they uh, – Jan – this was actually really cool in the beginning. When the when the ram knocks down the rocks, they, they actually do an able job of showing Jan get crushed, right? And you hear him say, Ugh! Yeah. And – uh, and fall. And in this sequence, somehow in the intervening few seconds, they've moved Jan. They haven't just lifted the brick off of his head. We saw a close up on that, but he's no longer, I can't see him in the rubble anymore where he was in the beginning. Do you, do you see him? I think they've, somebody's moved him. They, they, they've they definitely done. I, I feel like it doesn't seem like there's a huge passage of time because we basically get the fist of God coming through the wall uh, knocking everything down, Jan gets uh, crushed by the rubble, and then we have the tower keeper lift the rock off, reveal his bloody face. So we know Jan's dead. That's kind of the clue. We've got blood on the forehead. This is a dead, uh, dead person. Then we cut to the tank backing up, and and Schmidt arrives. So it's d- done so quickly. It doesn't seem like this was designed to have any passage of time, right? Right. And that's, so it seems like the hole is made, and we we don't see it. But there was, uh, you know, some Hydra soldiers right there who immediately have gone inside to try to get this tomb open before um, before Schmidt comes in. Now, uh, my head feels like I'm seeing. Uh, Jan's head in the rubble, but maybe that's just maybe that's just me. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very hard to tell. Thing. Yeah, I don't think that they. There just doesn't seem like there would have been time. But the tower keeper is still on the ground at this point, right? When Schmidt comes in, like he's he's either been knocked down again. Well, he doesn't get knocked or... down when the wall comes down. Like, it... so why is he on his back at second forty nine? Well, he gets he he bends he does get down on his knees to take the rock off of Jan's head. Um, and so and then, then he falls backwards and, and, and then 
I'm guessing that there was probably more stuff shot here when the troops came in and maybe knocked him to the ground. It's yeah. It seems like there was a passage of time here, but we don't actually. It it, it seems like there's a passage of time. There's also not a passage of time. It's awkwardly yeah. Uh, yeah. constructed there. We we miss because he was standing up when he went to bend down and pull the the concrete off of Jan. And then the next time we see him, he's on his up on his elbows, leaning back on his back as Schmidt walks in and he's looking back and forth. So I think you're absolutely right. They must have cut something here to trim up this scene. And one of those things was him getting hit by the butt of a gun or something like that. Like something hit got him onto the ground. Something. Yeah, uh, it's it's something happened because, I mean, yeah, I mean, all of a sudden we've got there are three um, Hydra uh, troops pushing the uh this the top of this tomb off we've got and we didn't mention the hydra lieutenant there is um uh interestingly uh a stark it is uh peter stark uh the actor who is is yelling at these guys to do it quick before he comes in and then he's interrupted oh funny and then there's there's like at least um four other troops that are standing guard so, I mean, a lot right, of people in the room. So there's yeah. a lot of time for all these troops to kind of get in and get into position and do all of this stuff. Uh, but also something happened to the tower keeper. <laughs> it's a little, little, little wonky. Yeah, it's like that, like that shot pulling back the tank and the, the, you know, all the movement of the camera was designed to hide some more significant time passing. Yeah, yeah, something. Something else happened okay. there. Something else happened there. And that's that's really it. We don't even see Schmidt close up in this minute. Yeah, we don't really uh, we know it's him. With, it's a, yeah, we won't talk. First, yeah, we don't. Yeah. We won't talk about uh, the actor or anything until next week. We'll give a, give a little more uh, detail about him and everything. Um, the only other thing I was going to mention here is this sarcophagus that we have here that the troops are pushing at. This was a sarcophagus of a Nordic king that they built here. Again, uh, trying to connect it with um, kind of the Norse mythology and Thor and everything. We're going to definitely get more of that in next week's minutes as uh, we see more of this sarcophagus, as we see what's on the wall, etc. But um, I, I like how they were really, they took this this town of Tonsberg, Norway, and they're like, okay, well, let's just, let's really... Um, ride this train all the way with this Norse mythology connecting everything. And actually, that was going to be the name of their first ride at Tonsberg Disney. <laughs> ride, ride this train <laughs> all the way to MCU Castle Rock. Ride, ride, ride the uh, sarcophagus train. Yeah, good the stuff. Sarcophagus good stuff. train. Everybody, put on your pointy helmets. That's right. That's good. So that's the end of our first five minutes. And now we're we're really into it. We're in it. We are in it. Yeah, we're uh, going to spend a little more time in Norway and then really jump into the, the meat of this movie next week. So and we'll have our first guest next week. Uh, looking forward to it. Uh, you know, this is a, a fun movie. I'm looking forward to really digging into this. A lot of setup going on this week. So uh, we'll see what it's all leading to when we come back next week. Can't wait. Remember, everybody, you can join us in our Discord community and... Uh, join the conversation over there um you know we have uh, people chatting about the movies and everything else going on in the world of marvel plus we have our live streams that we do when we're recording these shows um all sorts of fun stuff so we'd love to have you over there you can uh find our discord channel at truestory.fm slash marvel movie minute along with all of our other social links etc etc we'd love to have you joining in and uh being a part of this so all right pete any last words for this week You've had all the words I'm fit to give, Andy. <laughs> That's all. it. All the words right here, everybody. Well, everybody, thank you so much. And until next time, true believers. I could do this all day. Marvel Movie Minute is a production of True Story FM. Engineering by Andy Nelson. This season's music is Spread the News by Anthony Vega, and this season's show art is by Winston Yabo. Find the show at truestory.fm, and if your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, consider doing that for this show. Mm -hmm.